Greetings. This is your bass player, Glenn Brownie from Kingston, Jamaica. Remember me? <laughs> yes, yes. And this is um, a continuation of a reasoning. Right? We had a reasoning before inside the studio. And now we're having another reasoning to give you some of the history, you know, a little insight to the journey and all the people who helped to make me where I am now. But the beauty about this one is I'm in my yard. I'm in the garden. And I love it. It's green, lots of trees, pomegranate trees, tangerine tree, and my son is there doing the production. And you can hear in the background the church up the road, the people are getting into spirit. You don't hear anything yet. I want them broke loose one at a time when you're listening and you get an idea of what we hear. And sometimes these services can go on for six, eight hours. Sometimes I'm awakening in the morning, early morning. Oh, here's another friend. They call that Yang Yang. And sometimes it is really disturbing because you're at the point where the passing, you don't really want that, but then it's life. Peter Ashbourne. He's, first of all, he went to Berkeley. He was a child prodigy. He was playing violin, I think, like from five years old. And I mean, just doing it like nothing. But he pointed out to me, when I, when I met him, I saw him play violin every now and then, but I know him as a keyboard player. And he was saying to me, no, keyboard is actually his second instrument. He's an amazing arranger, band leader, composer, all of the eras of music because of his training at Berkeley. So now the experience with him was different because he he's now cultured in more the Western side of music, the classical side of music, the European history and concept of music, how you approach music. And nothing is wrong with it, it's just a different sound. And we can learn anything, so I learned a lot from him because when I really wanted to analyze jazz, straight ahead jazz, whether it's bebop or swing, whatever it was, avant-garde, he's the person I'd go to because he would break it down for you. He's great at analyzing and showing you exactly what is to go where. He started teaching me about modes and why you use this mode and with this chord because I, I didn't understand all that coming up. Remember, I'm self-taught, so everything is by ear, but I had the desire to do more, and I saw my limitation. So these people played an important part in freeing me from that kind of restriction of ignorance, not knowing. Some of them I know just, just by doing it, but I also like to have an idea of where this flight is going because I'm not on it and I like to tour. <laughs> but so it is. We're in the yard enjoying the garden in the evening. Quite nice. Yes, so Ashburn now, I used to do, when I came back, to, because I knew him before I went to the North Coast. And he went through college, did his thing, graduated, got his degree, came home. And he was like the key person for doing commercials, jingles. So that is what I, when I came back to Kingston in 1982, that's what I started doing with him mostly. Playing a lot of jingles for DNG. There, there's a popular one that people always recognize. It's called, um, um, There's a Taste for Life, Go For It, Red Stripe. Because again, it was slap bass and a lot of the kids start recognizing that, hey, Uncle Glenn, do some slapping, and that's cool, the way how I fuse it with reggae. Um, so I did a lot of commercials. I can't even remember some of them. You know, for Grace Kennedy, um, uh, Jerry and Neville, 
commercials up on commercials. He ruled commercial in those days. Jingle, he also showed me the difference between what a regular commercial is and what a jingle is, why kids get attracted to the jingle. And all this is how the music is put together, how it is played, what the melody is playing, how the chords are played. So it's, it's the science behind the thing, what makes it work for the function it is intended. So I did a, quite a few commercials and then I started playing. He put a jazz group together and called it Ashes. <laughs> Residue. I didn't like the name, but I love what I was doing because now I had to start reading. Peter got me into reading more and that was the weakest part of my development. Still not a top reader, but at least I can understand what I'm seeing now. So, now I'm playing for Peter Ashburn and the Ashes. Um, started reading, started playing a lot of jazz gigs, playing a lot of FM music when we play for dinners and private parties, um, doing jazz sessions, that's key. And then there was this vocalist named AJ Brown, who is now the vocalist for Third World. I know AJ years from in the 70s when he used to sing with a band on the North Coast, just doing top 40 stuff. But he's really a master at what he does now as a vocalist. So, we start um, recording songs for AJ Brown. Pete Ashburn started to produce him. And one of the popular songs that we did is called um, When You Love. It's a ballad. And he produced and arranged that song. And it was written by another virgin, Campbell. I don't remember what Campbell, but great song, nice, nice pen. Um, we also did, um, there's a kind of upbeat reggae one that Peter produced. I, I can't remember the name now, but that was also a popular song. All Fall Down. All Fall Down. There you go, son. <laughs> All for alone. Um, for any of those songs, just click the link in the description and you can go and hear the song. I also yeah. did another one with AJ Brown, but that was produced by Ibu Cooper, another past member of the Third World Band. But um, yes, so Ashburn now kind of brought me into the show music thing also. We did some pantomimes and some, some um, nice musicals. And the, the, the treatment for those music is completely different because you're going between um, jazz and classical, and you're putting in some pop in there, and there is some, um, what do you call that music again? Um, um, that kind of honky tonk kind of thing. I forget the, what style they call it, but because it's a show music, we have to do everything because, of course, the music represents the story. So any mood that the story takes, then the music is there for it. And that started getting my reading really sharp. And let me tell you who the players in that group was because it was really unique. Let's start with the drums, Desmond Jones, master drummer. Guitarist, Wigmore Francis, he's also an educator. Um, Orville Hammond, Professor Orville Hammond, he's um, one of the teachers at the school of Edna Man, the school of music. He was on synthesizer and second keyboard. And of course, Peter Ashbourne on keyboard and violin. And if we're doing a, a big gig, then we would get some other people to come in if we need conga players and so But Brother, let me tell you, that was some challenge. Uh, first of all, you needed to have good chops because a lot of the stuff we were playing is really up tempo especially the bebop stuff, up-tempo. And then we, we get into funky stuff, so I could get to use um, slapping technique and you know, getting into funk sound. We're playing stuff from Earth, Wind and Fire. We're playing stuff from Weather Report, um, Blood, Sweat and Tears. Yeah, that was what, so you know, he would arrange. Oh, Peter was also the band leader and conductor for the big band, the Jamaica big band. Um, you had another big band which was uh, Sonny Bradshaw, not that, 
that was like the staple big band at the time. But Ashbourne, did he have a name for it other than Ashbourne Big Band, something like that? But we were doing some really cool stuff. We did stuff that was different from the Sonny Bradshaw Big Band. We were into fusion stuff and some strange music and some of his composition. I remember we were doing a gig with um, with AJ Brown. This is uh, a yearly concert that AJ would put on with models and artists. Cheryl Lee, Ralph, she was in it one year. Anyway, the story I tell you now is, you know, my love tells story, you know. So we are in Soundcheck, the day of the show, Fashion Follies, big production. And we are in the room at the Pegasus Ballroom and we're doing with sound check, getting everything, we're tightly fitting a corner, have the big stage with the catwalk and thing. And we have about 10 or 15 minutes left for sound check before the room goes silent and lights out and we leave, go upstairs, get dressed to come back to perform. At that point, somebody came to Peter and said, Peter, we need something to go in here. We need something for about five minutes. What you can put in there for us? Peter said, but we didn't prepare any other music. We didn't write it. And she said, um, no, we need to have something. You have to find something, Peter. And Peter just said, OK, you want something? OK. And Peter just said, um, this is a piece that I wrote when I was in Berkeley. Let's see if we can play it. <laughs> Glenn head start feel warm round us up because I know what this means now. It means that Peter going to put something in front of me to read that I didn't have time to prepare to, to go through it because I'm not a sight reader. Anyway, it is a 6 8 song. It's called Open Ralph. It, it was actually the, the show with Shelley Lee Ralph and he titled the song Open Ralph because that's what we opened the show with. That's what we end up opening the show with. And I think you'll get a chance to hear what it sounds like because the other day we did a little taping of it because we never had a recording of it. So we did a little thing, so you'll get to hear it. But check it out, very interesting. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six. Pada, 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 pa ba da ba ba da pa ba I don't, I'm not going to go into the rest of it. I can't sing the melody. <laughs> but you'll get a chance to hear it. So stuff like that now kind of gave me more confidence to approach my own creative ideas because I can hear more. I'm exposed now to what make the music, what, what the science of the music is in order to get certain emotion out. You know, what, what color you paint to get if you want a certain idea, you want to create a certain kind of feeling. And that was great for me because I wanted to know those things. As I said, I love jazz, but uh, I didn't have the chops and I'm walking and I didn't know exactly how to walk. So I'm walking and I'm bucking my toe and I'm falling down, tripping over my finger and tripping over my head and all these things. But once you clear the smoke, and you say, oh, this is what this is. This is how they approach this. Then it became easy. Now, I don't have myself as a jazz bass player. Nope. I understand it and I can function to a level in it if, I, if, I, if that is required of me. Because I've done a couple of things I've played with. Um, I played for Ernie Ranglin. Um, Ernie Ranglin, by the way, for those who don't know, was Jamaica top guitarist and was at one time world number one guitarist. Ernie Ranglin, you can go and click again and, and look for his stuff. Amazing jazz guitarist. He also performs with Monty Alexander, who I had an opportunity to work with also. But in that capacity, Monty had this thing where he likes to fuse things. He likes to bring people from different cultures together and have them play their song and their music. And it's really a unique thing. So we would segue from a, a reggae trio to a straight ahead jazz trio. And then sometimes the two things intertwine to create another song. That was another whole experience. But um, yeah, Ashburn got me straight 
and gave me the kind of experiences that was necessary to get me to the point that I am now. Because a lot of time when I'm composing my music or I'm even playing a bass line in a session and it's a roots music, sometimes I draw back on some of those same very thing, you know. And I look at them and look at the, the sound and the color and I look at the bass line and I listen to the melody because I like to play when I'm hearing the melody. The singer inspires me to play certain things because I know the subject. I know what he's saying. I know where his punctuations come. I know where the dynamics of the song is, you know. So it, it helps to do that. But of course, in this business, sometimes we're in the studio and we don't know what the song is. You just know you're going to play a rhythm, you know the key. And you say, okay, give me a feel, the drummer start a feel, maybe I'm doing straight four like this. One, two, three, four, or maybe it's a boof buff here. Do, bap, do, do, bap. Or it's just a straight ahead, one drop. So you just create that feeling for that moment. You know, it's like your opinion, you have a conversation and you state your opinion at that time. Sometimes I hear the song long after and I say, that song sounds familiar, it sounds like my bass line. Or when I'm really convinced is sometimes when I get a statement and I see the title of a song and I see that is I play the song and I'd call the producer and he'd say, yeah man, you played that. But anyway, Peter Ashburn, Cedric Brooks. And I must say, because when you're playing along with brothers like Orville Hammond, a master keyboard player, Wigmore Francis, a master guitarist, Desmond Jones, a master drummer and a master musician. You're learning things from them too because I love drums. I used to play drum for a short time, so I love drums. So it gives you a very good sense of time and rhythm. And when you're playing beside somebody like Je Desi, who is so articulate in his playing, and all these other musicians, you, you're bound to learn something. And I'm grateful that I learned a lot from them. And it is those experiences through the journey that helps to make me the bass player. And not just the bass player, also the person that I am. Because Cedric Brooks was a great influence on me. And I see Rasta culture. And I see his imperial majesty. I see the king, yes. And I see Ethiopians start to check the history. I know that's where I find myself. So I want to play music that will portray that. You know, whatever it is that I play, it should have something that says, yes, this person is rooted in that. Because I play all kind of music, all kind of music. But there is something, there must be something in there that can say, yeah. There is something that's coming from a foundation that is far more important than all the frills that you see. And that's the important thing for me. The root of the thing, the foundation of the culture, the expression, and what is it you represent? Your music, our music is reggae music. We have different sections that we started with ska, then rocksteady, reggae, rocksteady, rockers, dance hall, and all of them. None is more important than the other because they all speak to a specific time, the social order of the day, the generation that is ruling that period of time. New technology comes in, the kids start hearing different sounds. So I'm still alive here and well. So whatever it is that I'm exposed to, I'm going to work with it because I see myself as timeless and boundless. I'm limited by my own limitation, and you are too, so aspire for greatness. Don't say, no, I don't. I, I used to say, I don't want to play like that, and, I, and that is fine. But I end up listening to a lot of people that I don't want to play like.